Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Liberal Hall. My name is Esma Zirak. I'm one of the assistant curators here at this museum. At this time, I ask that you kindly disable your phones and other devices, please. Our speaker this evening is Mr. Scott Wyatt, who is the current president of Southern Utah University. He served as the president of Snow College from 2007 till 2013. Mr. White has a bachelor's degree in philosophy and economics from Utah State University, as well as a Juris Doctor from the University of Utah. He practiced law in Logan for a number of years and is a also a former member of the Utah State Legislature. We are honored to have such a distinguished speaker here tonight. Mr. White shall speak for about 45 minutes, after which uh, he shall receive your questions. Without further ado, we welcome Mr. White to the podium. So I've been in Salt Lake this week uh, working with the legislature to remind them how important education funding is. And, um, and I'm reminded that what a more pleasant drive it is from Salt Lake to San Pete than Salt Lake to Iron County. <laughs> it's a bit shorter. Uh, anyway, I'm very honored to be here and uh, grateful for this chance to visit with you. Um, let me set that aside. We're going to talk tonight um, about two separate subjects, either of which could consume hours, weeks, months, years of discussion. The first, of course, is American slavery. America did not invent slavery. It's been in existence forever. Um, but the slavery that was in America is a bit unique in that it was racial slavery where one class became the property of another class. Um, the second topic is Mormon polygamy. And uh, the Mormons didn't invent polygamy. It's existed from the beginning till through all time and still exists in the world today. But these two topics merged um, both in time and space and energy uh, back in the 1850s. And so let's build up to the moment at which they actually merged and I'm just going to back up a couple years rather than take this long history of either of these topics we're just going to talk about the intersection of these two topics. In March of 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe, up in Connecticut, wrote this little book that became unbelievably famous. In its first week, it sold 10,000 copies. In the first year in the United States, it sold 300,000 copies. The first year that it was available in Great Britain, it sold 1.5 million copies. The book, of course, painted in a more uh, humanistic way the way that slaves were treated in America. It showed them as property. It showed that they were being sold apart from families. Um, and it galvanized the feelings of people throughout, particularly the northern part of the United States. To sell 300,000 in the first year with only about 25 million Americans. Divide that out by households. And that's a lot of books. Well, there's a second thing that occurred, and this is less than two months later. And that is that Orson Pratt, um, out in the Utah Territory, made public announcement of the plurality of wives. And so the Mormons had been practicing plural marriage back at least till 18, as early as 1835, three years after the church had been organized. But it had been a secret practice until they moved to the Utah Territory, where it became open to those that lived there. But in 1852, August, it was announced to the world had an enormous impact on the way people saw the Mormons. These two things moving along kind of together. And then in January of 1854, um, got to get my directions right, um, something happened in the United States that kind of blew the world up. 
This is 16 months after the Mormons announced polygamy. It's the uh, Stephen Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. This act changed the whole world. As you remember, anybody north of this particular line could not have slavery regardless. And if you were south of the line, you could. Kansas and Nebraska were both north of the line. They were in that part of the territory where slavery had never been allowed, would never be allowed. But Stephen Douglas wanted to take this issue away from Congress. He saw the fighting and all the difficulties. He wanted to be president of the United States. He wanted to get rid of this controversy once and for all. And he thought the way to do this would be to just simply um, allow those within the territory um, to make their own decision. He called it popular sovereignty. And so as a state gets ready, as a territory gets ready to become a state, they have a vote. And whoever votes um, win, that, uh, that group gets to choose. So it would be slavery or not slavery in any territory in the country. Um, shortly after that happened, almost two months later, in this little teeny place right here uh, in Wisconsin, a whole bunch of people that were free soilers, uh, Democrats, um, Whigs, got together and said, you know what, if this bill, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, actually passes, um, we're starting a new party and we're going to call it the Republican Party. This is 1854. Well, it didn't take long before this act actually did become law. May 30th, 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed. Um, and now what happens is, is we find ourselves in the middle of a grand contest, a contest where those against slavery feel like everything is on the line, and those that are trying to protect slavery feel like everything is on the line. And you know what's going to happen now. Um, this is Senator David Acheson and also Senator William Seward. These two people are representatives of these two sides of the dispute. Here's what William Seward said. He announced to his Southern senators, since there is no escaping your challenge, I accept it on behalf of the cause of freedom. We will engage in competition for the virgin soil of Kansas, and God give the victory to the side which is stronger in numbers as it is in right. So since it's popular sovereignty, since each territory gets to decide, since now the territory of Kansas is formed, and it's now we've got to figure out who's going to win the votes, um, we are going to flood Kansas with anti-slavery people. Um, and from the South, David Acheson of Missouri wrote, we are playing for a mighty stake. The game must be played boldly. If we win, we carry slavery to the Pacific Ocean. If we fail, we lose Missouri, Arkansas, Texas, and all the territories. And this was a huge threat to them because if you can't expand it, then it starts to die. Um, and you all know what happened. It was a very difficult period of time. Bleeding Kansas is what we called this time. Um, and all of these people are merging. The Missouri ruffians who come across the border in numbers greater than those from New England um, were ahead of the game. Part of what's so interesting about this piece of the story is this. Um, this is what Atchison told Jefferson Davis. Quote, we are organizing. We will be compelled to shoot, burn, and hang, but the thing will be over soon. We intend to Mormonize the abolitionists. Where does that come from? Just 15 years ago, they had shot, burned, and hung the Mormons until they drove them out of Missouri. And with that experience, successful experience, they knew they could do this again with the abolitionists. 
and they did it with a vengeance. Atchison and the border ruffians swelled the vote in the first Kansas election, held in November of 1854, the second held in March of 55. In preparation for the March election, Atchison wanted an absolute guaranteed victory, though he really didn't need to because the Missouri ruffians had cleaned the place out fairly well and dominated the number of people that lived in the state. But this is what he said. Mark every scoundrel among you that is the least tainted with free soilism, free soilism being um, freedom rather than slavery. Um, Mark every scoundrel among you that is the least tainted with free soilism or abolitionism and exterminate him. They had experience with extermination as there had already been an extermination order against the Mormons. Atchison's lieutenant exhorted a crowd at St. Joseph to all those having qualms of conscience, the time has come when such impositions must be disregarded as your lives and property are in danger. Enter every election district in Kansas and vote at the point of a bowie knife or a revolver. The results of the massive voter fraud were very successful with the Kansas Territorial Legislature being comprised of 36 pro-slavery and three non-slavery people. Now there's a broader story of this because the governor at the time was aware that there had been all this fraud and all these things go back and forth, but in the end, um, we still had, and there was a second election. But when it came time to seat those in the Territorial Legislature, the original 36 were still seated. And of course, um, that gave the slavery vote to Kansas. Um, all right. Now, in the tradition, oh, with all of this Missouri Compromise, um, what happens? Abraham Lincoln comes out of retirement. So he'd been a little bit frustrated with politics. Things hadn't worked exactly the way he'd hoped. Um, I find the billboards and all this talk about failed, 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 and then finally succeed, um, that really doesn't paint an accurate picture of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln really succeeded, 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 succeeded with a few setbacks here and there, and then succeeded big. Um, but if you actually go back and look at how many elections you won versus how many he lost, um, all of his other successes in life, he was an enormously successful person. But there came a time that he got frustrated with politics and decided that he was going to hang up and go back home and practice law and just devote all of his energies. And he sat there until the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And when that occurred, uh, he came out. He came out very, very frustrated. Um, and he starts attacking um, Douglas. He delivered a speech. Um, I'm going to get to the speech in a minute because I think it'll fit better in just a second. Well, in the tradition um, of and three years following Uncle Tom's Cabin, there began to be all of these anti-polygamous literature published. So what we're going to talk about are the parallels in how those that were against slavery uh, and those that were against polygamy behaved almost exactly the same. And interestingly enough, many of them were doing the same things. For example, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote both anti-slavery and anti-polygamy literature. Um, so three years after, so we're in 19 or 1855, um, and uh, this book comes out. It was probably written by Arthur Orton uh, under the pen name of Alfreda Eva Bell. This is 1855. The book is called Boudicca. Boudicca is the name of a Celtic warrior queen, and he used that name for this book. It presents a wildly inaccurate and sensational story 
for the emerging working class. The price of the book was 15 cents. This would be about $4.38 in today's money. And there were all these nickel and dime books that were coming out because literacy was improving. Um, most of the women could read and they wanted to read all these kinds of books. And so they were coming out like crazy. Um, and as you can imagine, $4.38 for a new book, that's not a bad price. Well, here's the story um, in Boudicca. A beautiful 17-year-old Mormon girl marries a dashing young Mormon man named Herbert, who promises to be faithful to his new bride for life. Soon after their marriage, a high church leader tries to convince her to become his spiritual wife. She could still live with her husband because spiritual wifery didn't demand that she live with him. Um, and she can have multiple husbands. Polyandry is just fine. Uh, Boudicca, who takes her marriage very seriously, refuses. Hubert happens, her husband, happens to come home one night with a dark and mysterious woman who he says is going to be his second wife. Uh, another woman who refuses to allow her husband to take a second wife kills two, two church leaders and then is murdered by Brigham Young in an act of divine vengeance to atone for her sins. Herbert is strangled by a church leader who is infatuated with Boudicca and his body is dumped in the Great Salt Lake, which in the novel is an easy walking distance from the Seoul settlement in the state. The Mormon elders dress up like Indians. This is before the Mountain Meadow Massacre. Um, Mormon elders dress up like Indians and massacre traveling settlers to steal their money. After nearly every other character in the novel is killed, which includes a total of 14 gruesome deaths, Boudicca escapes from Utah with a traveling party and returns to the United States where she publishes her journal in the form of this book. Um, a little wildly sensational. In all, there were between 80 and 100 of these books published, plus magazine articles and newspaper articles. They had the same effect as Uncle Tom's Cabin had. Um, all these people on the East that had all of these very proper values that saw marriage as being critical to democracy and everything else um, are all of a sudden reading all this literature, what they are accepting as true, of uh, it's pretty serious stuff. Um, and they panic, and they've got to find a way to stop it. Well, in the backdrop of this novel and all these things that are happening, on June 17, 1856, the New Republican Party meets in Philadelphia. One of the delegates, by the name of John Wills, is from California. Wills is an attorney. He had family back by Philadelphia, and so was planning to go visit them. And when the Republican Party realized that he was going there on his own already, um, they selected him to be one of the Republican Party delegates to this very first national convention. Um, they traveled down around through Panama because that was the fastest route to get there. Um, by the time they arrive on the ship, he discovers that he's now the chairman of the California delegation. And as the chairman, he's put on some committees in Philadelphia and ends up being asked to be the drafter of a statement on slavery for the Republican Party platform. And as he's walking around Philadelphia, Chestnut Street, it dawns on him that he can make a stronger point on slavery if he includes polygamy in the same phrase. And so he invents, without having been asked by anybody, he invents a phrase, twin relics of barbarism. And in the first platform, we find that the Republican Party is devoted to eradicating from the territories the twin relics of barbarism, polygamy, and slavery. Polygamy comes first, slavery second. Now, when we get into the debate in the Republican Party about this language, there was a significant group who said, we don't need the word polygamy because everyone knows that polygamy is a subset of slavery. 
And so the debate occurred. But he thought it's a stronger phrase and had enough support, and ultimately it ended up being adopted exactly as he had written it. And it goes, resolved, that the Constitution confers upon Congress sovereign power over the territories of the United States for their government, and that in the exercise of this power, it is both the right and the duty of Congress to prohibit in the territories those twin relics of barbarism, polygamy, and slavery. Uh, okay, we have now married, if I can use that phrase, <laughs> we've now married polygamy and slavery in the United States. The literary campaign that was started uh, with Boudicca, uh, as I mentioned, between 80 and 100 books, really goes crazy. Let me read you a few of these books, uh, or mention a few of these books. Um, Alfreda Bell in Mormonism Unveiled claimed that Mormon men bought and sold women. Maria Ward in Female Life Among the Mormons claimed that the surveillance in Utah was as cruel and remorseless as the bloodhounds who tracked runaway slaves. Meta Victor in Mormon Wives wrote, repulsive as slavery appears to us, we can but deem polygamy a thing more loathsome and poisonous to social and political purity. Harriet Beecher Stowe and Horace Greeley, who were two of the most well-known anti-slavery writers, themselves wrote anti-polygamy materials. There was the nickel novel series, uh, Buffalo Bill, in which Brigham Young dispatches raiding expeditions on wagon trains for the purpose of bringing back young virgins to Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, who tracks his first murderer to Mormon kidnappers of Gentile women. In Buffalo Bill and the Danite Kidnappers, a wagon train is completely massacred by Mormon Danites, save for the two young maidens who their mysterious savior tells them were the intended victims. Shortly thereafter, the raiders track them down with bloodhounds and make off with them to their Salt Lake City stronghold. Only with the aid of Buffalo Bill are they spared the fate waiting for them. Brigham Young himself gives the heroines an opportunity of either betrothing themselves to him or being handed over to the Ute chief to be his squaws. What's interesting about all of this literature is that it's obviously pretty sensational. Um, is that one of the motivations for attacking polygamy was that it damaged marriages. Um, and also that because of polygamy in Utah, Brigham Young had instituted some pretty liberal divorce practices. So of all of the states in the union except for Indiana, women could get a divorce in Utah easier than anywhere else. And in fact, Brigham Young said, when a woman becomes alienated in her feelings and affections from her husband, it is his duty to give her a bill of divorce and set her free. He further claimed that for a husband to continue to cohabitate with such a wife was tantamount to fornication. And so those policies and practices and state laws were extremely liberal in granting divorces. Brigham Young himself granted 1,645 divorces during the time that he was a leader. And so the anti-polygamists were saying, this is kind of a side note, but I think it illustrates an interesting point. They were saying on the one hand that, that, that polygamy is tantamount to slavery because the women were being uh, kidnapped, captured, held against their will, not able to escape. And on the other hand, it's destroying marriage because divorces are far too liberal. Look at all of these people that are getting divorces. And nobody really drew the connection that obviously these women weren't being held as slaves because Brigham Young was giving them divorces um, faster than any other state, save perhaps Indiana. Well, how successful was this literary campaign? Um, it would be difficult to know exactly 
the cause and effect that this literary campaign had, except that when you look at congressional speeches, public lectures, newspapers, editorials, sermons, and other novels that came after this first wave, they all followed the exact same tone. They used the same language, same tone, emotive style. The cadence was all very, very similar. So it seems like it had an enormous impact. We now find ourselves um, moving up to 1857. Here's another interesting little connection. Stephen Douglas was saying um, that popular sovereignty is the rule to govern all. That those in a territory ought to be able to vote to determine this peculiar um, domestic institution of slavery if they choose. And in a speech that um, Lincoln gave on the Dred Scott decision, he criticized Douglas by saying, if the people of Utah shall peacefully form a state constitution, tolerating polygamy, will the democracy admit them into the union? There is nothing in the United States Constitution or law against polygamy. And why is it not a part of the judge's sacred right of self-government for that people to have it, or rather to keep it if they choose? Meaning, Douglas, if you are really sincere about allowing the, the territories to choose their domestic institutions, then certainly that means you would be just fine if a territory voted for polygamy. Well, Douglas wasn't okay with them voting for polygamy, and neither was Abraham Lincoln. But it showed that the interplay of these two topics together and actually um, damaged uh, Douglas's popular sovereignty. Um, this speech, as you, many of you know, the Dred Scott decision. Um, Dred Scott is pictured here in the middle. Um, so I won't go into details of that. The most important and interesting part is how even Dred Scott, Lincoln, and Douglas find themselves in their debating, talking about slavery and polygamy together. Well, in 1857, um, this guy, Justin Morrell, introduced the first anti-polygamy legislation. It starts in 1857, but it is impossible to get it through Congress. It's impossible to get it through Congress because the southern states refused to vote for Congress to have the power to restrict a domestic institution in a territory. They thought that polygamy was horrible. That was a terrible thing. It was destructive for families and for the country. But even though they felt that way, they weren't going to grant Congress power to do it because they knew exactly what would happen if they did. And so we don't see any um, laws on anti-bigamy until after um, the South has seceded from the Union and Congress has been drained of all the Southern members. And then it goes through easy as can be. This is Morrell's speech, his first speech on anti-polygamy. Um, you'll find this interesting. In 1857, in one of his most first and most important anti-polygamy speeches, Morrell stressed that the question of the Mormons' peculiar institution, quote, seemed to acquire greater gravity in each successive year, end quote. He connected the issue of polygamy to that of slavery in overt and impl implicit ways, arguing, among other things, that the Mormons in Utah, quote again, who believe that bondage and polygamy are Bible doctrines, close quote, not only had imported black servants and enslaved Indians, but had also reduced white women to the level of beasts, quote, making women no longer an equal to man, and man the tyrant, degrading her to the level of a mere animal. So the quotes are from his speech. 
The broader text is from a dissertation written by um, a woman by the name of Sarah Berenger Gordon, um, who in reading all of the texts um, points out and summarizes how inflammatory his speech was. I don't know that there were a whole lot of Mormons um, who um, imported black slaves and had enslaved Indians and those kinds of things. But wow, talk about sensational discussion. And all of that seemed to flow from these novels um, and such that had already been written. Well, less than two months after the Morrell Act um, was effective, within two months, Lincoln announces the Emancipation Proclamation. He announces it, um, uh, let's see, so the Morrell Act became effective in July. Lincoln announces the Emancipation Proclamation in September and then it became effective January 1st, 1863. Uh, Anti-democratic. Now this flag is the um, flag that would have flown at the time of the Gettysburg battle. Lincoln argued that democracy would be destroyed by slavery. Um, the fact that one group in a society built on self-governance could vote out the power to self-govern of a subset of that people would have ultimately the effect of completely destroying self-governance and democracy. The polygamists argued the same thing in a slightly different way. They argued that the tyrannical husband who had a slave or slaves for wives would be unfit to participate in any reasoned debate or to vote because they would always be trying to replicate the tyrannical policies of their home into the political arena. So the arguments were slightly different, but both of them had the exact same argument, that this was destructive of um, this democratic issue. So it wasn't just that polygamy was wrong, it was that polygamy was going to destroy democracy. And lastly, um, in terms of looking at these analogies, once we get through all of this, um, the Civil War is over, and the Northern Radical Republicans try to restructure the South, um, which didn't work all so well. But Congress um, tried to restructure Utah in some of the same exact techniques. They took away voting rights. They required them to swear to loyalty oaths, expanded federal jurisdiction for the federal courts. And so in some respects, um, reconstruction was done following all the same patterns. And so what we see is that these two things were going on at the same time. They were both inflamed by popular literature. Um, they both um, were seen to be subsets of slavery. By the way, by the time we get to the um, Republican platform of 1860, when Lincoln was running for president, the, um, the phrase twin relics of barbarism was removed. Um, I assume because by that time, those that felt that, that polygamy was a subset of slavery had won. So I just talked about slavery. Um, the, uh, the literary campaign and all these different things um, flowed together. Anyway, so there you go. It's interesting how two topics that for my, most of my life I thought were totally unrelated, um, the Republicans brought them together, and those people who were anti-slavery were pushing in the same ways uh, anti-polygamy. This was not all that long ago. So my dad's um, grandfather, or my grandfather's dad, either one, um, was both alive at the time of slavery and had plural wives. Uh, and it's interesting to think of how recent that is in our history. It is just not very long ago. Um, we're not reaching back very far. Anyway, there you go.